Okay, let's start then. Morning, folks. I'm Wilhelm Kirchgesner. Uh, I'm holding this lecture today extraordinarily, uh, but as of next week, Professor Waldscheid will take over again. Um, but the, the thing is, today is a quite special session because we're not talking about reinforcement learning in particular, but rather about supervised learning, which is a third branch of machine learning, as we will see. And uh, nonetheless, machine or supervised learning is also beneficial for reinforcement learning. And all your later lectures will also build on the principles of supervised learning. So that's why we have this uh, lecture today indented. So and we will start first with a motivation background, as usual, for supervised learning. Then what the problem statement is of supervised learning, what's the difference to reinforcement learning, how can we merge that together? After that, what is actually improving supervised learning or how, how can we improve machine learning models that build upon supervised mm -hmm. learning, especially through feature engineering. This is only one lever or one degree of freedom on which mm -hmm. we can improve mm -hmm. supervised learning, but this is one of the most uh, crucial ones. So that's why I think it's very, very important that we talk about that today. And Last but not least, we will talk about two very typical models in supervised learning or in machine learning in general. That is linear reg regress regression and artificial neural networks. So this picture you have seen already in an earlier lecture. We usually split machine learning up into three branches. That is supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. We were talking all the time about reinforcement learning. But today we will have a look or peek into this branch, supervised learning, where we don't want to improve a policy necessarily, but rather just have a, uh, a function approximator optimized. All right. And um, first of all, if you find the lecture today interesting, then there's a lot of other material you can catch up on. Uh, for example, we have further courses that deal completely only and exclusively with supervised learning or machine learning in terms of uh, supervised learning, for example, a statistical and machine learning course by the communications engineering department. Maybe you have sit in that lecture already. And also from the computer science department, we have the classical machine learning one and two as well. Um, besides that, we also have, of course, not me, but there is a lot of courses online, online courses that you could attend to um, hone your skills in machine learning and supervised learning in general. Um, very popular courses are those on Coursera, for example, or um, one course which is also very close to programming would be Practical Deep Learning for Coders by Fast AI. I can really recommend this one. Or if you just want a very slight introduction into that topic, you could also go to the courses that are um, hosted by Kaggle, the so-called Kaggle courses. And if you're not so the online course guy, but you would la rather look into books or read books to that topic, or if you want to have a more in-depth introduction into that topic, then there are also, of course, a few classics, one by Mr. Bishop, Pattern recognition. It's a bit old nowadays, but nonetheless, it is a good introduction into the uh, basic fundamentals. Then we have elements of statistical learning by Hasty and Tip Sharini, and um, a book exclusively dealing with deep learning is then the deep learning book by Ian Goodfellow, Goodfellow, Bengio, and Corval. And this one is even. Um, doesn't cost anything. You can just look it up online, just Google it, and then you will have the full material as HTML files and you can read through it. It's a very comprehensive material though. So um, if you read the full, the full book, you will have a really deep understanding of deep learning. <laughs> right, so today is only, is only a very slight introduction because we can't cover, of course, everything for, uh, in, the ter in terms of supervised learning in just one lecture, but it should give you a good overview and also the concept, a conceptual understanding of the uh, of those building blocks that we will also need for reinforcement learning later. 
Okay, machine learning in general in industry. So you might have heard also from news that machine learning is a fast growing industry. There's more and more demand for people who, who have expertise in that field. Uh, most of the time you hear that in the context of embedded systems, mobility or digital assistance, for example, Alexa and Siri are digital assistants. Um, and most of these applications They don't use reinforcement learning, they use supervised learning. They just have function approximators optimized on a certain mapping that was set out in beforehand. And um, that's why supervised learning is, is important to, to know and even more prevalent than reinforcement learning in the industry. Um, that's why uh, also high school machine learning engineers will be the demand for them will be growing and growing also in the future. So it is worth it to, to study that. Um, if we have a look at a few instances of machine learning applications, we have the classic recommendation system. So which website or which ad should be displayed on a website for which user, uh, which product is going to be put into a cart next in order to maybe um, make the user buy more or put more things into his cart, shopping cart. Also, classical instances of applications are forecasting, where we want to forecast some user demand, some sales, weather, or Uber calls in order to optimize the drivers for a, uh, for a certain city. But also, an engineering application could be to forecast the material attrition in some engineering process, where we could apply predictive maintenance, for example, That is, if we can forecast that a certain machine will break, like in two days or so, and we have some technician sent there already to replace the part before there are, um, before the whole process must stop for several days because some part has broken unexpectedly. Uh, most of the time we can we can distinguish the applications into classification tasks and regression tasks. And um, into, in which, in these tasks, we also have uh, speech assistance, like Alexa and Siri, pedestrian detection, where we classify whether some object in a picture is a pedestrian or not, for example, that would be classification. Fault detection and engineering is also a classification example. Um, Credit scoring could, yeah, would be rather a, uh, yeah, it's also classification, but we are not, we are not predicting zero or one. Someone is going to fall, uh, default on on his or her credit or not, but it's rather a, a probability that would be output by the model. So this, this person is 50% percent probable to default on a certain credit, so that that guy cannot have. We cannot have his uh, application approved, for example. Uh, and regression means we're not we're not classifying something, but we want to fit on a certain floating point value as close as possible for as many operating points as possible. Okay, so for classification, the target is our integer numbers, so to say, class zero, class one, class two, and for regression, it's a floating point value. Is it? 10 degree hot or 12 degree hot. That would be the big difference. And the uh, last inst instance of a machine learning application would be generative models. You might have heard a lot lately about ChatGPT. This would be an instance of a generative model. The G in ChatGPT stands for generative after all. And those are all the models that are not optimized on a certain on a certain metric like classification accuracy or regression estimation accuracy, but rather on um, how, how well new content is generated and how similar that is to, uh, uh, to other previously seen instances. Right. So if you, if you get hooked to supervised learning after this lecture, I would also like to point out that there are online competition platforms where you could register and then attend or participate. 
where you are given some task, that is most of the time you're given some data set, and then your task is to build a model or train a model that will have the best accuracy, the best estimation, estimation accuracy, or the best classification accuracy. Most of the time, the background is from industry where uh, a good algorithm is sought after. And if you participate there and you are really good or your submission is really good, you are eligible to win also some prizes, which might be interesting. And the prize pool is varying a lot. So sometimes the prize pool consists of 15,000 US dollars, but sometimes if it's government funded, it also goes up to 1 million. So there's quite a lot of money to win. And it's also a nice motivation to get deeper into the topic of machine learning. What's interesting here to note is maybe that most of these competitions are again of the supervised learning type, although there are more and more reinforcement learning type competitions also hosted, but those come uh, not so often with a prize pool. Okay, how does the pipeline look like for a supervised learning program? Most of the time, it actually starts with the acquisition of the, of the data. For reinforcement learning, we usually have an environment where we generate observations one after the other endlessly. But for supervised learning, we usually work with finite data, data, set, data sets that have a finite, finite amount of samples. And um, even if you don't have that to begin with, you would need to acquire it somehow. For example, at a test bench where you can measure something and then after you have measured for a couple of hours you end up with a data set and that's what you work with um, but it, it's it sounds easier than it is because there are quite some aspects to to consider when you measure a process for example whether you have all the operation points covered during your measurement or whether you have maybe only excited the system in a certain amount in a certain way, but your machine learning model should generalize actually to different operating points as well, and you should actually make sure that your data acquisition process is comprehensive and covers everything that you would expect your model later to also see. <clears throat> um, then if you have the data set, if you acquired it, or even if you're handed over a data set from a different company to analyze it and to build machine learning models on top of it, you would usually start with an exploratory data analysis, a second step, where you first check what's the condition of your data set. Is the, are the signals very noisy, for example? Do we have weird outliers in some measurement sessions? Um, if you just ignore those, those quirks in the data, and you just jump into building machine learning models, then you can you could end up with very bad performance, and you don't know why your model behaves like that in certain in certain uh, situations because you haven't you haven't had a look at your data beforehand. So that's actually very important, and also takes a lot of time before you actually start building a model. Be uh, beware of that. <clears throat> um, then, if you have identified all the, I would say, difficult situations in the data and all the samples that are okayish or those samples that could be used for building a model, so if you have clean data, you could go over and start doing feature engineering and key sampling. Feature engineering is also a topic that we will have a deeper look into later on in this session. Uh, but that what this actually means is that you try to uh, come up with new features, that is new columns in the data that you create from the other columns or from the other signals that you have in order to, to uh, expose your model to new patterns in the data. We will later see what that actually means or how that could look like. But feature engineering is, is very important and it means that you, that you try to, to come up with new patterns from what you're given in order to make a model, uh, to give your model a better chance to learn the, the functions. 
and resampling that just means that you are for example you're measuring a signal at 20 <laughs> kilohertz so re really fast sampling rate but your model is supposed to only output an estimate every one second then you also don't need your model to learn on on all the 20,000 samples per second so resampling means then to undersample or oversample <clears throat> Yeah, and if, if we're done with that, the actual machine learning ev evaluation can begin. So maybe the, the exciting part, more exciting part, that is just number four. Uh, there we would apply different model architectures or model families and see empirically whether they can learn the function that we want them to learn. And if, it's, if it works to some degree, to some extent, you could also go ahead and optimize your model again. There are different ways to do that. For example, feature engineering again, or hyperparameter optimization, or other optimizations. We will see a few instances later. And uh, usually at the end of such a project, of course, you can't avoid that. There should be a report written and some visualizations to, to explain what you have found out and what the insights are and maybe whether you have some informed, um, whether you can suggest some new, some decisions that should be made on a business level. Okay, then. What's actually different, the difference between supervised learning and reinforcement learning? In simple words, the difference is that in supervised learning, we try to approximate a function, whereas in reinforcement learning, we try to approximate a policy. <clears throat> um, that is, in reinforcement learning, we usually have environments that we can excite or we can, we can sample it for more observations, whereas in supervised learning, we have a finite data set that's what we have to work with, and there's no more unseen data we could easily generate most of the time. <clears throat> However, there are two situations, or at least two situ situations, where we can mesh those two things together, supervised learning and reinforcement learning. The first one, the, the very obvious way is also what we are going to, to do in the upcoming lectures. That's why we deal with supervised learning after all right now, is that uh, we want to deal with environments where there are so many states that we can't possibly put each state and uh, an action state value or a state value into memory. So there, there's no way to, to use our tab tabular methods that we have seen so far for these certain environments. So we need to, instead, we need to apply an approximation. So we come up with a model that has a finite set of parameters. And with these parameters, the model approximates each of those almost infinite states. Yeah, that's, that's why we need supervised learning and function approximation. We can't, we can't have a, a dictionary-like structure, data structure, that maps a state into a state value because there would be too many states. We rather have a function together with some parameters. It outputs for each state some value that stands for the state value. And if we, if we change some of the parameters, then a lot of state values could change them accordingly. Whereas for tabular methods, we could change just one state value for one state and all the other states would be unaffected. That's the, the advantage and the drawback of going with function approximation. <clears throat> and the second scenario would be imitation learning, just to give you a, a different example. We're not going to use that actually in this lecture, but this is a, a imaginable scenario where we, ha where we have, for example, we want to do reinforcement learning, we want to optimize a policy and uh, just from scratch, the reinforcement learning agent is not able to learn the policy or is not even able to achieve a 
accuracy, a policy performance that is close to some default policy that we have at our hands. Um, so we would go ahead and use uh, supervised learning to learn the default policy, like a PI controller, for example, in a controlled engineering aspect. We have a supervised learning learner to learn the default policy. Having learned the default policy with the with a neural network, for example, we can start then from there and apply reinforcement learning to go beyond the performance of the uh, default controller of the default policy. <clears throat> yeah, that could be, for example, expert moves in board games. If we find that learning reinforcement learning from scratch doesn't lead us to some policies that wouldn't be better than what we know um, before already. So we start to teach, for example, teach the model through supervised learning that there are those expert moves or the um, PI control example for uh, controlling some states in the system. <clears throat> All right, then to the supervised learning problem statement. Usually the formal notation is that we have some data set B that consists of input samples and output samples. Input samples then as X and output samples as Y. And they consist of uh, capital K samples. And we can enumerate them from zero to K minus one. <clears throat> and what we want to do with supervised learning is that we come up with a scenario or want to have a function that is uh, that would would be fed with x and it outputs y and th this perfect mapping denoted by f star is probably not achievable by a function approximator because it's approximated after all but it will give some some estimate with some accuracy and in the, the ideal case the estimated uh, sample y is close to the real ground truth y. <coughs> the real values are also often called ground truth in supervised learning. <coughs> and um, how do we evaluate how good such a model is? Usually we have different uh, metrics for the to measure the goodness or fit of a of a model after it was trained or before it was trained. Maybe you have heard of those metrics. The mean squared error for regression is very popular. Classification accuracy for classification tasks. There are several and they have different advantages and drawbacks. Um, usually for regression, most of the time, the mean squared error is the, is the metric of choice. <coughs> um, as I said before, it is very unlikely that we will find a perfect fit because uh, we, are, we are not storing all the states in memory, so we're not learning by heart what each state value should be or what, what the mapping should be uh, in a dictionary-like data structure, but rather we are approximating this mapping for all the states with a finite set of parameters. The parameter set is called the uh, W. <coughs> so F, F of W is, is little, looks a little bit different than our ideal F star, but should be as close as possible. And um, this set of parameters is not, uh, can, it can be varied during optimization or during a hyperparameter optimization. We can vary that, that length of parameters we want to use for the function approximation. So, um, what we win or what we lose with that is that usually if we if we use more parameters and put more and more learnable parameters into the model that we can get closer to an ideal mapping but most of the time we would also lose general generalization capabilities because we are starting to learn by heart that mapping from x to y <coughs> we will see in a, in a second how that could be visualized <coughs> Um, yeah, but except for except for the set of parameters W, there might be also other parameters that we would call hyperparameters that decide 
how the topology should, would look like in a model, for example, how, how the parameters omega are put into, into relation. Uh, for a neural network, that would be, for example, the number of neurons, the number of layers. Uh, also for the optimization, you would have parameters like the learning rate or uh, what optimization strategy we want to follow. Those are parameters that can also be optimized. <coughs> Okay, so bias and variance, what do we mean with that? Here we have a visualization. On the left side, we have a classification task and on the right side, a regression task. So here for the classification task first, you see there is a set of blue points and there is a set of red points. And we want to find a decision boundary that uh, hopefully discerns those two colors as best as possible, also for potentially future samples that would uh, pop up maybe in the future. <clears throat> and we have here two lines, one is bright in bright green and the other is dark green. And uh, you can see that the bright green decision boundary, boundary is way more erratic than the dark green boundary. So in fact, this was uh, fitted with a machine learning model, the so-called k-nearest neighbors, uh, where we would, where we would each point in the space, we would uh, classify to a certain class, so we have two classes here, red or blue, depending on what the neighborhood looks like, how many samples in the neighborhood would have class one or class two. <clears throat> and we, if we use nine neighbors, then we are, um, much more robust with the dark color. And if we only use one neighbor, the bright one, then we have a very, very erratic line. And for exactly this set of points, the, uh, the classification with only one neighbor would be more accurate. You can see that this line is, is distinguishing between red and blue way better than the dark green line. But you, you would agree that if there are future points popping up, then probably the, the dark gray line would be more accurate because it looks like that there's a lot of noise in the generation process. And in fact, most of the time we have noise in our, in our samples and our observations. So the dark green line is actually more robust. And in the future, it would generalize better probably. So what we actually do here is or what we see here is that the bright green line has a lot of variance, we call it variance, and very low bias. So it is really close to the ground truth, but it has a lot of variance. And the dark green line has less variance, but higher bias. So higher bias means um, in the, on average, it's uh, worse on the classification task, but in overall, the generalization capability would be probably better for the dark green line, although it has a higher bias. <clears throat> now for the regression task, you could imagine there are, there are no classes anymore. There are just a bunch of points, a point cloud, so to say, and we want to fit some line into that such that we would have the least distance from the line to each point. That would be a regression task. <coughs> And in dark green, we have a linear regression. So we try to fit one straight line into that point cloud. And for the bright line, line we have again uh, two nearest neighbors. So two, two neighbors are used to fit where uh, the next point should be. And again, you can see that there's more bias for the straight line. So on average here, the straight line is not fitting better in this point cloud than the erratic line but this erratic line would probably be worse than the straight line if there are more points coming up in the future so the generalization would be probably also better for the green line rather than for the bright line <clears throat> so to sum up we are always after the generalization accuracy, not for the total accuracy on data on which we fit our models. <clears throat> but the problem is we only have a finite data set in, in, in contrast to the scenario in reinforcement learning. So how do we generate 
more data for, for the supervised learning case. <clears throat> you simply can't most of the time. So what you do is you just beforehand you split the data already into a training set into a test set. The test set is then the holdout test set on which you would measure the gener generalization capability of the model. And the training set is what you use for training. <clears throat> but how, how do you split the data into training and test set? That's again a, a whole new different question. And um, usually the best thing you could do is to analyze very thoroughly your data and, and figure out where or which samples are rather outlierish mm -hmm. and which samples are rather subject to interpolation rather than extrapolation. But mm -hmm. if you don't want to go into such an analysis in beforehand, you could also go with simple tricks like so-called so -called k fold crest cross-validation. That is a very popular <coughs> cross-validation technique where we just randomly split the data in a training set into five different folds. We say folds this, but it's just actually five different portions of the data. <coughs> that is, um, for example, we, we don't do it here randomly, but we say the first 20% belongs to group one, the second 20% of the training set data belongs to group two, and so on and so forth. And then you repeat the training five times. And for each training experiment, for each training iteration, you uh, denote one certain group or one certain fold as test set, while the remaining folds will act as training set. That will leave you with five different models, admittedly. So you would need to go with averaging to get the ultimate prediction for that, for that whole data set. But uh, at least you avoid the problem of figuring out whether maybe some operating points in one fold are very different from the operating points in a different fold, so to say. So that means if you have if you have very high errors here in that fold, while here there are very low uh, low errors, then you have already a good indication that your data set is not very homogeneous that you rather go into a deeper analysis again how you would how you would split the data <coughs> but usually if you if you assign your samples randomly into these five folds then there's there's not too much of a difference between the folds and you have a very smooth um, uh, smooth performance estimates for the model for the models mm -mm. so what's the what is the role of this test set here? Usually, if you if you don't optimize hyperparameters, but only the weights of your neural network or the coefficients of your linear model, then it is sufficient to just work with one k-fold or the whole data set. And if you average the five performances, then that's the overall performance. But if you also go ahead and you want to optimize, for example, the number of neurons in your in your neural network and also the number of layers, then it you could end up actually optimizing your hyperparameters onto your certain cross validation. So you would end up with a too optimistic estimate of the performance of your model. That is, <coughs> if you do hyperparameter optimization, you will need another test set could also call it generalization set, another holdout test set on which you can uh, evaluate the generalization capability of your model after the hyperparameter optimization. <coughs> In the real world, if the data set is very large, you might not rely on k-fold cross-validation. You, yeah, you would do k-fold cross-validation where the k is not five, but maybe one or two, so that you only repeat the training two times or even only once, and you accept that your split might not be the best 
in the work um, because you don't have the time to do so many trainings and so many iterations. Um, but if your data set is not too large and training time is also uh, not taking over, then k-fold with, for example, five folds or three folds is very popular. <coughs> So, now you did a training, for example, you have some value for the estimation accuracy for the generalization of your model. How would you go ahead and improve the model? There are different ways to do that. For example, a very, yeah, a very easy way to improve it is to just collect more data. Because if we collect more data, the chances are higher that we have covered maybe more operating points than we have before in our smaller data set. And having more data is most of the time always better for our model training. Um, of course, at some point in time, you might have covered all the operating points in your system, such that having more data is not revealing any more information. But usually modern model architectures like deep neural networks, they benefit from more and more data or they scale better with more and more data. So collecting more data is a very straightforward approach to improve the accuracy of your model. <clears throat> Another way is just to change the model architecture. So, for example, if you have a nonlinear problem and you apply a linear regression, of course, that might not be a very good fit then. And uh, using a nonlinear model or a model that is capable of approximating a nonlinear fun function is more advisable. Or you optimize the hyperparameters. As I said, maybe your model is too small, maybe it has too few parameters to approximate the function you actually want to approximate. So, uh, giving giving more degrees of freedom into the model could also help to get a better fit of the model, uh, of the function. And a very special way would be to have a lot of different models learn the same function. Each of them do the modeling or do the uh, mapping a bit differently. And if you average across them, then usually you would come up with a better accuracy than using any of the single models. But of course, you also need way more parameters because each model comes with its own set of parameters. <coughs> so that is usually something you would apply if your machine learning process is running on a server or on a big workstation where computing resources uh, exist in abundance. Whereas if you want a machine learning application that runs on an embedded system, for example, in a car where we have very limited computing resources, then you probably wouldn't go with this method where you average across several different models, but you would only try to fit one certain model with, a, with very few parameters, but being designed in a very clever way such that it will have a good fit despite having only few parameters. And yeah, the most, or the most efficient way to improve your model's performance is actually feature engineering. And that's why we will talk about that next, because um, usually if you, if you measure a process with a certain set of sensors, for example, it might be that these sensors, they emit some patterns that your model does not understand very well because of the architecture of your model or the topology of the model. But if you just if you just combine these sensor readings in a new way, that could reveal suddenly something that is really easy, linearly separable, for example, or really easy to, to understand for the model. We will see that in a second, what that means. Um, but that's why just adding features together or or creating new features is very effective. Doesn't cost a lot, except for some experimental, or yeah, some time for experimentation, and um, is actually even easier than collecting more data, depending on where they come from. So, feature engineering is our next topic. <coughs> 
and we should definitely talk about that. So additional features that might be, for example, new sensors that you incorporate into your system because you figure it out. Uh, I can't, I can't capture the a signal that is really uh, descriptive of what I want to estimate. So I just spend another sensor at a certain place of the system that I haven't measured before, for example. That's a way to come up with new features. <clears throat> way easier, of course, is to hand design them. That's where the word feature engineering comes from, uh, where we um, yeah, merge the sensor readings that we have into some new ways that we would just append to our previous set of features such that the model has more observations or a, a thicker observation vector to work with. <clears throat> and um, we could also automate that. You might have heard the term auto ML that stands for automatically doing feature engineering where some programs or algorithms would try a lot of different features uh, in a lot of different constellations with different model architectures uh, in order to systematically come up with a uh, with a really good set of features <clears throat> which would stand in contrast to the hand design features however it is uh, it sounds easy to do to do auto ml but it always takes a lot of time so usually you are coming closer or faster to your goal if you do hand design features than applying an auto ML tool that is running for days or weeks. And <clears throat> I've said before that more data is always better. So you could come up with the idea, yeah, if we can just append new features to our data set where we just combine our previous features in different ways that this is also more data and more data is always better so do it indefinitely no that's not the case because if we if we're not increasing the amount of samples but rather increasing the amount of features in our data sets so the amount of different columns in our data set then we are actually making our observation space sparser so there are the, there are more dimensions in the search space but if the amount of samples are not uh, correspondingly increased as well, then these features, these dots in the hyper, in the hyper area, in the hyperspace, will deviate from each other further and further, and it is more difficult to find patterns in that space. <coughs> so that means it, it is usually better to have a model that can work with very few features than having like hundreds or two hundreds of features generated automatically beforehand and uh, have the, the model work with that. So the simpler way is always the better way because then generalization is most of the time also better on just a few features than, than on a lot of features. <clears throat> Especially if you're in the process of adding more and more features or trying different features, omitting some, adding some, then it might be that you come up with a feature which is just a really good descriptor of your of your function for your function by chance because the noise in the in that signal really aligns really well with your target and it looks like this is the, the killer feature this is the the feature with which your model will have a really good function approximation but of course the generalization is not really good because it, it depends on noise in the training set you will not have the same noise pattern in your test set. <clears throat> so be beware of that. So some visualizations again, how does feature engineering look like? Um, <clears throat> imagine that you have again a point cloud and you want to do classification again. That means we have blue points and red points again and we want to come up with some decision boundary. <coughs> So it might look easy for you how we could discern them. It's just some, some circle in here, right? And inside the circle, that's class one, and outside of the circle, that might need to be class two. But um, you would need a model that is able to 
that is able to place circular decision boundaries. That is a linear model would not be well suited for that. But if you add new features, that is a feature that we call R, which is the, the vector norm of the width and the height, and we come up with a feature uh, tangent, uh, theta, theta, which is the arcus tangents of the height over the width, then, and we visualize them here on the right side, then you can see that the classification task is now linearly separable suddenly. So we can come up, we can apply a linear model that can only place straight lines into the cloud, um, which would give us a really good match here, a really good decision boundary, whereas a linear model would would not be able to give us a really good uh, function approximation in this case because of the circular decision boundary. So just by feature engineering, we reveal new patterns to the model with which the model might be able to come up with a way better function approximation. <clears throat> for This is for classification. For regression, I also have here an example. On the left side, we have the original feature space. That is, we have one feature and one target. The feature is, that one feature is also called regressor in the regression uh, case. And the signal, that's what we want to estimate, the y-axis. And if we go with a linear model, that means linear model again placing a straight line into the point cloud for one feature, that is only two coefficients one coefficient for the feature, and the second coefficient is the bias term. If we place it here, you can see, yeah, there's no really good way to, to place that straight line such that all the points are uh, minimized and such that in the future, new points will also be, will be uh, hit by that straight line as best as possible. But if we take the log transform of those features, as you can see here on the right, and not of the feature, but of the target in this case. If we log transform the target, then it becomes way easier to fit a straight line into that cloud such that all the points, uh, the distance to all the points is minimized for all the values in the regressor. Whereas here you see the further away we go with the regressor, the further the distances become to that straight line. So again, this is for the regression task, an example, how feature engineering can help to get a better, get a better fit with fewer parameters in the model. <clears throat> um, normalization is also something we should talk about. Usually you don't feed all your sensor readings directly into the model as they are. Usually you, you need to normalize them in order for the optimization algorithm behind to work better. There are different ways to normalize the data. Um, the most popular ones are standard scaling, where we subtract the average of some feature from each sample and uh, divide by the standard deviation, such that uh, the mean of the new of the normalized feature is going to be zero, and the standard deviation is going to be one, human standard deviation. <coughs> Uh, the second way is called min-max scaling, where we subtract by the minimum, so the, the, the least value of x that we see in the data set, subtract by that, and then divide by uh, the uh, subtraction of the maximum and the minimum, which would uh, leave us a new or a normalized feature where the value range goes from z uh, minus 1 to plus 1 through that normalization. For the standard scaling, there's no guarantee what the value range is, but for this min max scaling, we can definitely say all the normalized values will be between minus one and plus one, though there is no, there is no statement about the average value. <clears throat> and the simplest form of normalization is just dividing by a certain value, for example, the maximum of the uh, absolute value just to have everything between um, minus one again and plus one. Though one boundary is probably never never hit by that. 
So if you if you imagine you have a temperature which goes from 20 degrees Celsius to 80 degrees Celsius, and you just divide that temperature by 80 degrees, it might go up until one normalized value, but it will not go to minus one because it, it is just uh, a division. It will go from uh, <coughs> If you divide by 100 deg degrees Celsius, it will go from 0 0.2 to 0 0.8, but it will not be negative. Whereas, if you would have done the max scaling, it will always go from minus 1 to plus 1. Yeah. Um, but what happens if you do not normalize? Uh, especially if we optimize by a gradient descent optimization technique, where we want to uh, calculate gradients, those features with a big value range will seem to have a uh, less of an impact than those features with a small value range. And you could, you could run into some numerical problems if there are big differences. So having all feature, features range in, this, in the same domain helps to better figure out how to optimize that. <clears throat> now a few words to the data types. Um, usually in a data set we will have uh, different, different types, for example numerical data, 2 or 4, 0 or 1. Is the system switched on or off? Then we have integer data types, just numbers, like number of rooms in a building, for example. Um, amount of switching vectors in a inverter. Those are instances of integer types. Then real valued ones are the most prevalent ones in a engineering context for sure, uh, which are just floating point numbers like temperatures or current measurements or voltage measurements. They belong to that category. And we have categorical data types. That is, for example, classes like blue, green, and red that um, might have no that might have no ordinal context to each other. We can't say blue is bigger than red. We can't say red is smaller than yellow. Maybe on a on a spectrum we could do that, but usually there are variables where that's not so easy. And we also have categor cate categorical variables that do have an order or that are easily put into an order like educational experience. <clears throat> How do we normalize categorical data? So usually there are different ways to do that. A very popular way is the one hot encoding. So we have three classes for example and we would have one column for that class so each sample belongs to zero for class one. Uh, the next sample belongs to uh, has a one standing there in that col column for class two and three and so on, that would be an integer encoding. But maybe you have no ordinal behavior in that and your model would always assume there is some ordinal relation because it's zero, one, two, right? So two is bigger than one, one is bigger than zero. But these categories shouldn't be encoded in that way. There we would use one hot encoding where we replace that column with three new columns, which are binary. So zero if that sample belongs to that class and one if it belongs to that class. That is one hot encoding. <coughs> um, but you could also imagine that if we have a lot of categories, like for example, in the Amazon app, there are thousands of products and you want to somehow encode them into a data set and you you usually have an integer number for each product and you would do one hot encoding, then your data set would become very, very large, right? And a lot of zeros are there. So you would have a sparse matrix. There are methods that work that can work with sparse matrices, but usually in the end, it still, it still increases the sparseness in your data and patterns get, are not so easy to, to find in, in such data sets. So that is no viable way to normalize here. Instead, we could do mean target encoding, <clears throat> where we replace the category with an average value 
borrowed from a different real valued uh, column. So for example, what's a good example? For example, if you use again the Amazon app and you have identified that the user using your app belongs to a certain type of users and you have like four personas that corresponds to four distinct user types and you identified that your user rather belongs to uh, user type one, for example, and you know that user type one on average spends $100 then in your data set, you could replace that category um, with the average value for that user type. That would be called mean target encoding. Target because you could also use your floating point target for encoding. But this is then a bit controversial because you are somehow leaking target information into your training set, which could lead to too optimistic estimates. So that's something that you should be beware of or where you should be cautious. And the third way would be entity embeddings. This is the most sophistic sophisticated way to uh, normalize category categorical data where we would use a neural network that would just uh, that would just map the categories into a reduced set of output neurons, like 50 for example, 50 output neurons that have, that all can have different real valued numbers. So you have 50 real valued numbers which represent a certain category. And you don't, you don't give the rule for this mapping, the neural network would need to find out itself how to find this mapping. So this is a way how you could also encode a categorical variable with a lot of classes only in a reduced feature space. This is like a new feature space. Um, but yeah, it's more elaborate and um, needs to be evaluated empiric empirically. <clears throat> now to feature engineering. So how could we do feature engineering? We have seen the log transform already. We have seen that we could use a vector norm and uh, a phase, but there are also other ways. For example, <clears throat> if, we, if we assume we have a data set with three features, and these features, these features are called XK, R1, XK, R2, and XKC, where R1 and R2, R2 stand for real value floating point numbers, and C for a categorical variable, then a very typical way is just adding those two real valued numbers into a new feature or taking or doing a subtraction or the product or the division. Everything is possible. Everything will lead to a new feature. If we have category, categorical variables like XKC, we could also do a encoding where uh, we merge one, ran, uh, one real valued variable with a categorical variable by just taking for each sample, uh, subtracting by the mean value that is uh, exhibited for, e, for its group. That is, you see, for example, there are 100 samples with the color green, 200 samples with the color red, and then there's a real valued number like the height of the flower, then we have a new sample in the data set for one certain flower. We know it is, it is uh, red. We subtract the height from the average height of all red flowers, for example. This is then a new real valued feature. And uh, most of the time also a really, a really expressive and descriptive feature for anything you want to fit. <clears throat> then clipping, dropping, aggregating features or especially outliers away. It's, yeah, it, it probably belongs rather to data cleaning, but could also be seen as a feature engineering step. Uh, coordinate transforms, as you have seen where we 
change from polar coordinates to the Cartesian coordinates for the classification example. These are also really good features. In the, um, the next exercise, you would also see some feature engineering with coordinate, coordinate transforms where we could improve the performance of a neural network tremendously by having that feature engineering. So that would be a, a really good example for that. If we have a time dimension, we, call, we can also be creative with uh, how we incorporate the time information. Like um, we could add lag features, for example, for each instance, for each row in the data set, we would not have the current observation of a certain real valid number, but also the previous one, the penultimate one, the one before the penultimate one, and so on into that row, such that a model could act on all those samples at once. Or moving averages is a bit more elegant, to, uh, with which we could incorporate past information or history information into one row or into one observation. And of course, also in the frequency domain, we could add the uh, past Fourier transform or some, some coefficients of a past Fourier transform. They could go into a data set as an additional feature as well. So you can be very creative. And most of the time, there are some informed guesses what features might be good for the certain task. But sometimes it is worth to uh, explore a little bit more especially in um, those machine learning competitions on, on Kaggle. There, the, the best features are most of the time those, those factors that lead to winning solutions because someone found some feature that no one else have found and is really descriptive for the signal or for the target that needs to be fit. More than, more than find, this is more important than finding the best parameters for a certain model because Everyone is roughly using the same models, but feature engineering is then what discerns the winners from the average solutions. <clears throat> okay, and um, for the last part of this lecture, we go through two instances of machine learning models. A very simple one is linear regression, and the more elaborate one than artificial neural networks. <clears throat> so, First of all, um, you could just apply any model you want most of the time to any problem, but it would, yeah, it would be better to apply a model which is appropriate for the problem. So if you know that there is a, a linear relation between your target and your features, then of course you should use linear models. That would be it's very simple and easy to train and optimize. It has, has also a very small amount of parameters. <clears throat> and there are also support vector machines, but they're not so popular anymore. They were popular before the last deep learning wave, where we would uh, find a, uh, a linear separable decision boundary according to the closest samples to that decision boundary. But yeah, no one is using that anymore, actually. <laughs> Everyone is using neural networks nowadays. So deep neural networks are very popular currently and also all sorts of different architectures for that. We will just go through the most simplest architecture, but there are really uh, crazy inventions there and they all, they all have their advantages and drawbacks. And which is also worth noting are gradient boosting machines. Maybe you haven't heard of that so far, but this is actually a model that most of the time belongs to a winning solution in a machine learning competition. This is um, the uh, this is the combination of a lot of decision trees, small decision trees that are combined with each other in such a way that the the error is minimized, and they work really good if your data set describes not dynamic processes but rather some static relationship. For example, a data set where you have uh, characteristics of a house, like square feet of the size of the house, how many bedrooms, how many bathrooms you have in that house, and you want to, you want to estimate from these features, from these characteristics, on the sale price of the 
of the house. And there is no relation to any other row in the data set because these are all independent houses. So there, there's a static relationship between, uh, relationship between inputs and outputs. For that, gradient boosting machines are really, really well seated and uh, should, be, should be considered for your task. But in engineering, most of the time, we actually have dynamic processes like voltages and currents evolving through time, depending on each other and other uh, values in the process. For, the, for these, then, neural networks are actually better suited. <clears throat> so to, in order to visualize that, maybe here's a small meme. If you have a simple regression task, where you know you have a linear relationship, you shouldn't apply a deep neural network with a lot of layers and a lot of parameters because you would probably overshoot. Maybe you have a really good performance, but you could have also done that with a very small amount of parameters with a linear regression. So keep this picture maybe in mind if you choose a certain, a suitable architecture. So linear regression is really simple, actually. We usually say that there's one coefficient, one parameter for each input feature plus a bias term. And we want to identify these coefficients. And we can do it with, a, with an analytically closed solution where uh, we begin with a cost function. This cost function is the so-called residual sum of squares, or RSS, which is the mean squared error, actually. So ground truth y minus the output of our linear model squared. We want to minimize that. And if we, um, if we derive the residual sum of squares and set it to zero in order to minimize, we can see that we can directly put the equation together for identifying the coefficients. So this is the least squares equation, the least squares formula. The estimate y hat is just our identified coefficients, uh, sorry, is the regressor matrix times our identified coefficients w. And the identified coefficients are directly given by this constellation of the regressor matrix and the ground truth y. And this goes really fast. So you have the identified parameters almost immediately. This is not iterative, but an analytically close. So by pressing a button, you have the the parameters optimized directly. Um, one problem that could ensue in such a scenario is if you have input features that are uh, linear dependent on each other. That would be called multi-collinearity. -co multi um, that would lead, so for example, you have feature one and feature two, and they are the same, but there's just a negative sign for one feature, but besides that, they <laughs> always behave the same. Then your coefficients next to these features, they could grow independently. Uh, they could grow exponentially because they cancel each other out because you, you just sum it, sum it together, right? And if they grow very much, it could be that you would interpret them as being very, very important features because there's such a big coefficient next to them. So those features might be very, very important. Um, but in fact, maybe they're not important after all. They're just linear, they are just collinear to each other. So to mitigate that, you could add regularization terms, like uh, here the regularization coefficient is lambda, but here you, so to say, you penalize the, the norm of the weights in the residual, in the residual sum of squares in the cost function. By penalizing, you are effectively punishing the identif identification process for having two big coefficients next to the features. And then your coefficients are a bit more interpretable again. Um, the problem is, though, that for Lasso, you would usually, there is no closed solution form anymore. You would need to do that iteratively with an orth orthogonal optimization. Whereas for rich, it is still there's still a closed loop solution form. That's the that's the downside of the lasso. But um, 
there's another advantage that if you apply lasso and you if you buy the drawback that you have to optimize that iteratively there is also a uh, a thing that uh, the coefficients tend to become zero so those that are unimportant they tend to become zero so such that you could say okay that feature is not important at all for my process so i can filter that out directly so your model is, your model is directly telling you which features could be eliminated so that's a advantage of lasso <clears throat> okay and for artificial neural networks really 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 quick um, who has heard of how neural networks work before three and two now okay so an artificial neural network is a bit more complex than linear regression so we have as a building block a neuron and the neuron works like that that it takes a lot of input features combines it with a weight vector weight w1 weight w2 these are real valued numbers combining means they are just multiplied with x1 and x2 and so on and then they're all added together and at this point it's still linear regression right it's just having a coefficient of each input and adding them together that's still linear regression but as soon as we're here it becomes nonlinear because we put here a nonlinear activation function which could be the tangens hyperbolicus or the sigmoid activation function just a continuous differentiable function that is important uh, and that is lit nonlinear <coughs> it must be nonlinear so that the model is able to map also nonlinear functions or is able to learn nonlinear uh, relationships that would give us the output so that is just one neuron in, a, in an artificial neural network <coughs> so we have a weighted transformation of the input vector in other words and have it transformed then again through yeah through the activation function and each of the weight vectors here are also called edges because if we visualize it like that it looks like edges so you need to keep in mind that the parameters are in those edges not not in those bubbles here they are in the edges actually <coughs> and if we now put all the, these neurons together there are two degrees of freedom we could put those neurons uh, horizontally see horizontally that would be then one layer so here we see four neurons in one layer and then again four neurons in the second layer we could spend more neurons in one layer though that would be increasing the number of neurons in one layer and we could also spend more layers just on top of each other so these are two degrees of freedom how we could change the topology of a, an artificial neural network and the uh, the work principle is always the same there is a weighted combination linear combination and at the end of each neuron there is the transformation through the activation function that could be the same for all neurons but could also be different uh, different for each for each layer for example we usually characterize a neural network then with its depth that would mean how many layers we have in there and with its width that means how many neurons per layer these are hyperparameters <coughs> that means if you train a neural network these topological character characteristics don't change they are they are predetermined and after training if you see okay the, the, f the fitting is not very good then you could adapt these characteristics and then retrain again um, the equation for that is given by by this formula so here we have um, the activations from the previous layer times our weight matrix now it's a matrix uh, plus a bias term the bias term is not visualized here but usually we have here bias terms like it's like edges coming from nowhere you would have them here as well and the sum of these are transformed then by an activation function which is again a vector because we have we describe all the outputs here at once that's why it's a it's not a weight vector but a weight matrix 
<coughs> so the weight matrix has the shape uh, number of output neurons from the previous layer, x number of outputs in the current layer. And if we if we aggregate all these weight matrices for all the layers together, though those denote then the full set of chainable parameters in our neural network. But this is a a certain architecture only, the, the so-called feedforward neural network or the multi-layer perceptron MLP. So FFNN or MLP, these are two terms you will probably hear a lot in the future if you deal with more machine learning content because it's a really um, standard topology and everything else is more complicated. Uh, activation functions, here are a few different activation functions. Um, as I said, the tangent supervolicus uh, would be from minus one to plus one. The sigmoid is from zero to plus one. And very popular is also the rectified linear unit, the ReLU, which is just zero on the left half plane. And uh, linear with, with uh, slope one for the left half plane. Um, although, yeah. You can use whatever you want for intermediate layers, but the activation function at the last layer needs to be chosen depending on your task. So if you're using regression, you should use a certain set of activation functions. If you are using the neural network for classification, then you have to use a different set of activation functions. For example, for regression, most of the time we just use a linear activation function, so not, no nonlinearity in the, in the output. Whereas for binary classification, we use sigmoid, that is this orange line here going from 0 to 1, that's the, which stands, stands for the probability of having class 1 or class 2. If you're closer to 0, that is class 1. If you're closer to 1, that's class 2. And for multi-class classification, you would use the softmax activation function. And this one works in such a way that the sum over all output act activation neurons is going to be equal to one, such that each neuron stands for, the, for a certain probability that this or that class is what we see in that sum. <coughs> so it's really quick. Most of the time in engineering, we would have actually regression, so no, no complex topic here. Uh, as I have mentioned earlier, training of neural networks is done with gradient descent. That means there are, there is a susceptibility to local optima. That means it is very important how we start the training, so how, how the parameters, the weights are initialized. It could mean that if we initialize in some way the, the weights and biases, we could have a really good training. And if we repeat the experiment with uh, subtly differently initialized weights and biases, that we will have no good performance at the end of the, of the training because the gradient descent has started at some other point in the error landscape. And the first one was able to, to find a really good valley in the error landscape, while the other was caught in some local minima. You can't get out of that local valley. Okay, so gradient descent is always looking for the steepest direction of the error. If you, if you imagine the error landscape being uh, the error for two parameters. And if we have just a small valley somewhere at the top of some error mountain, and we get into that, then the, the descent or the slope always points into that local minima. And there's no way to just suddenly get out and go into a different, uh, bigger valley, for example. This is the problem for all gradient descent based optimization techniques. We also have that most of the time for neural networks. So it is advisable to repeat the experiment a lot of times to see whether um, the model is performing uh, bad because of the local minima or because the model is not able to actually learn whatever the initialization. 
So typical loss functions, you will also see that in the exercise later uh, for regression, we usually, usually use the mean squared error because then bigger distances are quadratically uh, worse. And for classification, we use the cross entropy or the log loss, which is, um, uh, which is usually used for, for binary classification, actually. But could also be used for multi class, uh, multi class classification. And uh, is usually advised or is, is to be preferred over the mean squared error in a classification context uh, because of uh, the derivative of that of the derivative of, these co of this cost function, um, which would be very close to zero very quick if our output is always between zero and one for the probability which we are using for classification. Um, that means training is not so effective if we have classification and using the mean squared error. That's why we have a different uh, error function. <coughs> Okay, so maybe a visualization for a gradient descent. Here you see again a, a dark green line and a bright green line, how they descend an error landscape. And um, the difference between the bright line and the dark green line is that uh, dark green is here the batch gradient descent, whereas the other is the stochastic gradient descent. That means for batch gradient descent, we use all the samples to calculate the slope at that point where we are currently at. Whereas for stochastic gradient descent, we would only use one sample of our data, stand, uh, of our data set to calculate the slope into which we should go, into which our direction of optimization should go, um, which is of course then more erratic because one sample is not really representative for the full data set. But most of the time it is close enough and most of the time it's faster to calculate the gradient for one sample than for all the samples at once. So usually people would take only one sample or a couple of samples and average across them to yield the, the error, uh, to yield the gradient and go for that and uh, eventually end up in the optimum faster than using the batch gradient descent uh, altogether. <coughs> okay. All right, so some words to the gradient. So usually you don't do that by hand. You would use a computational framework for generating the, the gradients. You you would use a framework, for example, in Python, we have TensorFlow or PyTorch. And there, there you would define a function with some mathematical operations that happen there. And the framework would know automatically that for your mathematical operations, there applies the chain rule, here applies the product rule. And it, um, it keeps in mind how to generate the derivative of the mathematical operations, such that you could go to the function once and then another time backwards in order to generate all the numerical derivatives for all your weights that are incorporated in your function. <coughs> yeah, forward step and back backward step. You could also do several forward steps and then do a backward step where you average the gradients across all the forward steps you had done before in order to, yeah, to, uh, integrate over more noisy steps. I have a, a very elaborate example here. So the, the pseudocode is uh, shown here. Usually, again, we have the forward propagation and the backward propagation. Forward is just executing the neural network where we apply the input features into the model. These input features are multiplied by the weight matrices plus the bias terms. They go through the activation function and then we iterate over the next layer and so on and so forth until we have all the activations. And then for the backward propagation, 
we calculate all the gradients and store them in a uh, placeholder variable here, gamma. We store them here, and at several iterations, at several points in the iteration, uh, the value here is exactly what the gradient is of the cost function with respect to the grade matrix and bias term, such that we can apply them then to the um, gradient descent equation we have seen before. That is just applying the gradient times some step length or step size. And yeah, what you should keep in mind here, on the former pass, you go from the beginning, so from layer one to layer capital L, and from backwards, then from capital L to one, so backwards. <coughs> so a real quick example now with very, very few, very few parameters or very few numbers to make it as simple as possible. Uh, so assume we have a, a observation x naught that has the elements two, five, and seven, and our target, our ground truth is two point five. And we have a two-layered two artificial neural network with a mean squared error cost function and the uh, sigmoid activation function. The sigmoid activation function is described by this equation. The hidden layer contains two neurons with output h, while the weight vectors are initialized with, as you can see here, a matrix. This is a through a three, three cross two matrix. You can see here the transpose symbol bias term is a row vector of two elements. Uh, the weight matrix for the second layer is smaller. It's just one column vector of two elements and the bias term only consists of one element. So the forward path is described here first where we just apply the equation for the, new, uh, for the layers such that we come up with an estimate of the neural network in the end. So the output is the estimate. That would be 0 0.198. And now we do back propagation according to that uh, pseudocode. Um, so you need to keep in mind that the derivative of the sigmoid is the, again the sigmoid times 1 minus the sigmoid. So maybe not so intuitive, but this is the, this is the derivative here for the sigmoid. If we apply that here and then just go through the backward path and collect all the derivatives, we will come up with the gradients. And you see here the gradient is always of the same shape than the weight matrix itself. Because yeah, at the end we need to apply that gradient, we just need to add it to the weight matrix with a certain factor, which is the step length, and that is then called gradient descent. So simple, isn't it? <coughs> so that's how we, how we acquired these numbers. So you, you have to agree that uh, backpropagation is somehow a mix of uh, symbolic, um, symbolic differentiation and numerical differentiation. Symbolic because we have those derivative rules baked into the process and numerical because we have actually numbers behind there. Okay, some words to weight initialization. You could just uh, sample from a random Gaussian normal distribution, for example, but uh, it has it has been proven that it is more beneficial to um, to reduce the standard deviation of that random distribution from which we sample the initial values for the weight matrices and bias terms uh, according to the previous layers, and that's called uh, I think Laureate uniform distribution. Yeah, it's just a, a small detail on um, how we initialize the neural networks. Um, but uh, nonetheless, no matter how you initialize or from which distribution you sample, you would always need to repeat that experiment because of the susceptibility to local optima during the gradient descent training. <coughs> then there are also regularization terms or as you have seen for the linear model we had regularization terms to punish two large terms for the coefficients. We also have that for neural networks where you also put into the cost function another term for regularizing the, uh, the weights or the norm of the weights. 
<coughs> we could do that with L2 or L1, although L1 is not so common. Uh, there's also a so-called layer normalization where we normalize by the standard deviation of the activation. So that means during training, there's some different behavior than during inference, during, tra uh, during testing. Uh, we have dropout where we uh, where we eliminate some activations randomly in the neural network uh, in order to to help all the other neurons that are not eliminate, el eliminated to uh, to understand how to make a good prediction without relying too much on other neurons. Although you should also do this not only for <coughs> very large neural networks, not for small neural networks. And yeah, regularizing neural networks at all should be done only for large networks where you have several layers, not for small ones. There it is too, there, there it hurts performance too much. <coughs> and yeah, we have not so much time anymore, but, so I'm going through this thing, through these things a little bit faster. There are, as I, as I have said, also more architectures, not only the MLP or the feedforward neural network, but also more elaborate ones like the recurrent neural network, where we have recurrent connections from one output neuron again to the input. That makes training a little bit harder. <coughs> and we have also convolutional neural networks uh, here on the right, which are very popular in image processing because they embed the uh, the filter operation of the kernel and uh, you if you have heard something uh, from the field of image processing you might know that there are filter operations in order to extract all the edges for example horizontal edges vertical edges or where you could extract some corners of of some objects in the picture with some kernel operations that slide through the picture here for that convolutional neural network is the very same principle here for a 1d case so where we have one signal and we have filters here which we slide from the beginning to the end of the time window in order to have intermediate activations that then all lead eventually to some estimation. <coughs> um, yeah. So these two architectures are applicable for, for time series problems where we have some time domain. <coughs> If we have only a static relationship, then there's no point in, in, in using them. Okay, then hyperparameter optimization. Um, just a few words. There are several layers of optimization, as I have mentioned before. The, the lowest layer is where we optimize the weight matrices and the bias terms, or where we optimize the coefficients of the linear regression. Then we are we are in this layer of the hyperparameter optimization tree or hierarchy. Uh, the layer above that would be then optimizing the hyperparameters, that is the topological parameters, the optimization parameters like the step length or step size. That's also a hyperparameter for for this layer or for this level. And on top of that, we would actually have even another level of parameters that could be optimized like things like the choice of the framework that we use, the, the boundaries of our hyperparameters at this level, for example. These things are not optimized when we optimize hyperparameters. You could also optimize them, but again, it would take more and more time to optimize them, and you would always need to trade off your resources you spent into making a model with the expected accuracy. Um, Frameworks for that, for hyperparameter optimization, are, for example, Optuna or Scikit Optimize or Python, for in the Python world, uh, which make the job a lot more easier. So you can have a look at them. For deep learning, we have also, of course, toolboxes like TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, Chaina. Oh, Chaina is not maintained anymore. I have seen a few days ago, so forget about that one. <laughs> it's just TensorFlow 2 or PyTorch. Um, and for gradient boosting machines, this is still up to date. Uh, X, X G boost or cross G boost. Don't, don't know how to pronounce that. So X G boost is really popular. Light GBM from Microsoft is also a good framework for gradient boosting machines. And Cat boost from, I think, Yahoo or Yandex. 
So there are big companies behind these behind these algorithms because they really have some value out of that. And for um, other machine learning models that are not neural networks, you could also just use one one um, one framework called Scikit-Learn, um, which has a lot or a plethora of different machine learning models, just not neural networks, but everything else is actually covered by them. Okay, now to, to sum up, uh, you have learned that machine learning skills are in high demand for the industry. Um, there is a trade-off between bias and variance depending on how many parameters you use in your model. Uh, Cross-validation is important to assess how well your model generalizes to unseen data, which is the most important metric for all cases. We have seen how we can engineer new features, what role they play and how to normalize them. And the fundamentals to linear regression and neural networks were are ho hopefully in your minds now. Okay, and then that's the end of the lecture today. Do you have any questions? Okay, if that's not the case, then thank you very much for your attention. And the exercise will be held in the other room, I guess, in this, in this direction. All right, yes. thank you very much.